Howdy folks, sorry to keep you waiting. I'm Ross Weaver, here to finish out the main part of my Metal Gear Solid V Explained Lecture Series. This will be Lecture 23, and I'm going to go over missions 47 through 50. And we're going to close out all the rest of the missions in this game and explain what the heck these last four missions are there for, and uh, why there's just stuff at the end of the game at all, and uh, all this kind of stuff. So... Uh, as you know, I've been talking about this little time travel plot deal, and uh, before we get into it properly, let's just go back and talk about the timeline. Uh, what we've just played through kind of covers mainly the events from 1986 to 1995, like on a primary level. And uh, we've also covered some events from after that, but mostly the Afghanistan and Angola campaigns when they first happened up to Mission 30, really, is covering 86 to 95. So we were in Afghanistan from 86 to probably about 89 or 90, and we leave there, then we go to Angola from 90 to 95. Um, and so missions 1 through 12, we were in Afghanistan, are also standing in, though, for stuff we know in the past. So there's also stuff from really before 75, but we're going to call it like 74 and 75 is kind of one chunk. And so what happens in missions 1 through 12 covers that 74 to really it's all 75 stuff. And uh, missions 13 through 29 cover the Rhodesia campaign from 75 to probably 79 is probably when it formally ended. Although I think 77 was kind of where that Code Talker mission where we kind of left off with it last ended. Uh, if you remember mission 29, Code Talker, and then Metallic Archaea, those both happen, and then after all of the cutscenes back at base, there's kind of this weird time jump that I talked about. So between missions 29 and 30, there's not really there's this time jump, and it's not really clear how much time passes as we play it. And now, what we're doing with the Code Talker mission in the game is probably I, I predicted happening in like 92, probably, um, and then. What would be what would happen after that's probably happening in ninety four maybe ninety three um but probably ninety four which you know there's there's your time gap but um so how does this relate back to you know uh, what's going on with with Frank hunter essentially and uh so this time gap covers really from seventy nine to eighty four it's it's this Iraq campaign that was kind of cut you know we've we've heard about all this stuff that Hideo wanted to do with, uh, you know, speaking about kind of Metal Gear's version of events with Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And I think this kind of deals with some of that stuff there. Um, so really, so after missions 13 through 29, we've, we've got this kind of dual telling of Angola and Rhodesia. So it's telling a story from 90 to 95, but also kind of retelling 75 to 79. And then we had this missing gap. Well, missions 47 through 50 fit in this missing gap. 30 and 31 then pick up after this gap, or also kind of are part of the gap too, you, you could say. Um, kind of like overlap a little bit of it. And then missions 32 through 46 are kind of our new cycle. So without going into 32 th through 46, because we've already done that, let's get back into this missing gap. Um, and why I think this is talking about time travel. So at the end of the truth mission... Uh, the last images we see of Venom Snake after he punches the mirror is him walking into this blackness in some mist. He's walking away from the camera. I think that right there is symbolic of time travel. Um, the blackness indicates kind of this you know blank can this blank blank slate excuse me, uh, kind of a blank canvas where you can just you know write anything on there that your imagination comes up with. And this in the mists I've said kind of sort of evokes Silent Hill-esque kind of logic so that you, you can think of the mists of Silent Hill as being able to conjure up demons from your own mind and such. And that's probably what's going on here uh, with Venom going into these mists. But it's not literally him going into some, you know, alternate dimension or something like that. Like, Survive kind of tries to tell you, oh yeah, we're in an alternate dimension and stuff like that. But then in Survive, we learn, uh, that, you know, we're in our own future. And so I think kind of the, the pairing to that that plot twist of we're secretly in our own future is also this we're secretly in our own past kind of deal. Um, kind of secret time travel going on, essentially. 
So, Mission 47, the war economy, total stealth. We're back in Africa. We're at the airport, and we're stopping another sort of proxy, you know, outfit. It's sort of another Diamond Dogs. You know, you could think of if this is uh, happening, you know, 75, 76, maybe 77, probably 76, though. Um, this would be like, you know, the, the sort of PF that Big Boss had put in place in Rhodesia to, to run all of his you know, stuff, and the war economy is us going there and picking up his, uh, you know, his, his guy that was going to run all of his sort of nuclear weapons, and uh, you know, maybe um, this is also kind of related to the, the guy back in the war economy that we played, where I kind of predicted that, you know, um, the other guy could have been Solidus, could have been George, but also could have been maybe a stand-in for Vamp, um, sort of another snake, though, that's kind of what's going on here. And uh, so this is probably happening, like I said, in 75 or 76. And for Frank, we know his Africa cam campaign really came first and his Afghanistan campaign happened later. And so this makes sense if 47 is the war economy and we've picked up this sort of nuclear weapons trading planning operation here and wrapped it all up. Now we've got to go get Next, we got to go get the guy who's you know behind all of it, and that's why Code Talker is next. And Forty Eight is an extreme Code Talker, and so this is kind of the pairing of this is kind of a Forty Seven and Forty Eight kind of are like the the Africa campaign kind of in microcosm, just shrunk down to kind of a beginning and an end. And so these two events, these two missions, I think kind of cover a lot of stuff on the timeline. Uh, really, you could say, like I said, everything from 75 to 79. Um, we've got, you know, the deaths of Strangelove and Sokolov happening here. Um, and it's it's said in the timeline that this happens in 79 and that Frank was the one who did it and there was this Iran hostage crisis. Um, so I'm kind of wondering if there was some kind of big event that was kind of skipped over in the previous retelling, you know, that we were going through in each of the missions. And maybe af sort of after that Code Talker event, or maybe even that Code Talker event itself is sort of symbolic of this this thing. Um, but it all, the, you know, with the, with the timeline's kind of implication of all of this stuff happening, let's see here. Yeah, the Iran Revolution, the hostage crisis, Eli escapes. All that happening in 79, there's kind of this gap between 79 and 77. And in 77, that was where it was revealed that uh, South Africa had a nuke test site under the Kalahari Desert. And I think that relates to Frank figuring out where all of this uh, nuclear weapons, you know, development was happening. It's sort of, the, you know, the child soldier parasite development stuff. And I think that's what Mission 48 kind of shows. Is So Mission 48 is probably taking place in 77. But it all, and, you know, Zero visiting Big Boss and vanishing. I've talked about that. That could stand for Zero getting captured by Big Boss, or maybe he just changes his identity. Um, there's there's a few different ways we can look at it, but at this point, it's you know it's likely that Frank picks up Zero, uh, sort of wraps up Strange Love and uh, and Huey, you know Sokolov's Huey, and uh, stops whatever they're doing. And oh, let's see what else is probably happening here. Uh, yeah, Big Boss is still probably running his schemes out on his own, even though he doesn't have his weapons developers. He's sort of already got the tech developed, and so he can kind of do his own thing with it from here. And so that's where I think he starts probably manipulating Solidus and gets Solidus to do all of his stuff and escape with Eli, who's probably Chico. And there's this defection, and more Foxhound members are made. And so the invasion of Afghanistan begins. And, and Afghanistan really is Iraq, so... That happening in 79 and the war kind of breaking out again, really you could pin that as sort of in between missions 48 and 49 here. Um, so after we've picked up this code talker and we've kind of cured the, the uh, whatever Frank's version of the, the parasite kind of outbreak was on his base. Um, I also think there might, the, I, just, I may be kind of skipping over this a little bit, but we know Hal is born in 1980. And so it's possible that after the two of... Uh, um, Strange Love and Huey were picked up in, in 79. Maybe they escaped again and weren't actually killed uh, by Frank in 79. You know, it's kind of interesting. Um, the whole idea of you know Frank killing uh, 
Naomi's parents. It, you know, it, there's there's a lot of layers of deception that could be employed there, and so I don't want to take that line too literally, um, and try to just spend too much time figuring it out here. So let's just get on with it. Um, so Mission Forty Nine is another occupation forces, and it's a subsistence one. So it's you know it, in Iraq we're probably going in early on with no support, and we just pretty much have to do it all ourselves to start out the whole process of stopping Big Boss again in this new region. And um, you can also think of root cause here. I kind of wrote down root in K-A-Z in quotation marks. You know, root cause is mission 27, but you could also think of cause as a cause here a cause, you know. And maybe this is like the root sort of, you know, sort of the root cause of all of Big Boss's uh, um, you know, reasons for rebellion and stuff like that that's being kind of pulled up here in Mission 49. You know, stopping the colonel again and all of his uh, his tanks that are on the move. Kind of, you know, the two tanks kind of implying those could be holders of parasite research that Big Boss is intending to bring to his you know base and do more stuff with. And maybe that's what's being stopped there. And, you know, with... with um, Occupation forces, I've mentioned how it kind of has a lot of symbolic parallels to, gosh, Mission 20, Mission 30, a lot of the big missions in this game, Mission 16 too. There could be a lot more going on, you know, rather than just, you know, a colonel in a truck with a couple of armored escorts. That's exactly, like I said, that's exactly the recipe for uh, um, traders' caravans you know, truck carrying the, the yellow cake. And we don't figure out that, the you know, the parasite's in there until the Africa campaign in our war version of it. So it's like we can kind of think that this Occupation Forces mission maybe has a lot more going on underneath the surface. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why it comes up again at the end. And like I said, how 47 and 48 are kind of a microcosm of the Africa campaign, really the Angola campaign. Um, 49 and 50 are kind of a microcosm of the Afghanistan campaign. It's kind of the beginning and the end. And, uh, of course, Mission 50 is Sahelanthropus, and I think this is kind of the stand-in for literally what happens in 1984. Uh, it's, you know, it's Fox showing up to stop Big Boss and all of the crazy stuff that I described in that last uh, <laughs> in the Mission 30 lecture, Mission 30 and 31 lecture. If you want to go back and check that one out, you can. But, um... Yeah, that's that's when all these people, all the rebellions kind of quashed. Most of these most of these people involved get killed and you know, have to probably take on a new form after this, which is useful, I guess, for cover identities and all that. But uh, it also probably is you know all the death and stuff probably is a lot of the reason why there's so much that comes after this, and uh, why that wasn't the end, and why we have to do everything we have to do in the game starting in '86. So uh, I'm gonna go back here and show you this this timeline. I kind of. Worked it out just real quick. Let me make sure you can see it here. So you can see, like, Frank's timeline's up on the top, and we got 75 to 84. And that's kind of mirrored by what Ricardo does in 86 to 95. And then, I've, oh, this was just kind of for my own thing, but you can kind of check it out there. It's like, it shows you, you know, Missions 1 through 12 are showing two things kind of at once, and then 13 through 29, and how all of them are kind of showing kind of dual tellings of, of one story literally and then a second story symbolically, and then we've got this little missing gap that we just covered there. So that's that's kind of it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot more to talk about, obviously. Um, you know, you can go back to all the lectures for those four missions and kind of fill in a lot of gaps here. But uh, I'm not going to do all that because this game's theme is do it yourself. So I'll let y'all do that yourself. And hopefully you've been following along this whole time and you didn't just start up with this last lecture and hope you just get the end of the book figured out because I'm not going to let you off that easy. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, 47 and 48 again are kind of a replay of literally the Angola campaign, but it's probably happening in Rhodesia. And so the guy who was Ahab and has become Ishmael has traveled back in time and now he's literally Ishmael to another version of Ahab. Um, and he's chasing him down, picks him up, uh, stops him after, you know, mission 50 and then runs him into the another, you know, into the hospital. And then the whole thing repeats. And, uh, 
like I said, that's about all I've got. There, there's more stuff in the timeline. If you're wondering again about this this timeline stuff, this is the timeline at the end of the Truth Mission, and all of the stuff that's in there is again, it's telling you a literal event that we already know happened at that date, but it's symbolically standing in for something that happened in the, the whole history of Cipher and the conflict between Zero and Big Boss. And the Zero side's kind of the U.S. side, and the Soviet side's kind of the Big Boss side, but it's also kind of Ocelot's side after '84. Um, it gets complicated, but you can kind of go back and uh, check all that stuff out. And I hope you've enjoyed these lectures. Uh, this is, like I said, a short one. Um, I wanted to talk about a little bit here, too, what I'm going to do in the future with these lectures, uh, this lecture series. I'm not totally done yet. There's, there's more stuff to talk about in the Phantom Pain than just the missions. Um, I've also talked about a lot of side ops already. But there's also some, um, just some sort of like non-mission and non-sort of, you know, op-oriented kind of uh, content in there. I wanted to talk about the structure of Mother Base for a little while. Uh, specifically, I want to talk a little bit about the animal conservation platform. That one, that'll be a fun lecture. We'll do that one maybe next. Um, I also want to do a lecture about Quiet. Just an entire lecture about her and about how people have talked about her and how people treat her character. Um, I'll just tell you right now, I think it's kind of a travesty the way most people treat her character. I think most people don't actually respect her on a like base level as a character. They don't even like pay attention to what her desires and wishes are. They just kind of impose their own desires and wishes upon her. And I think, I'll just say it here real short, I think Quiet as a character is kind of a commentary on the audience's own uh, misogyny. And how that's gone on throughout the years in Metal Gear. Um, it's, you know, quite, it's kind of a litmus test. Um, for your own, you know, ability to see a character for who they are. Instead of just, uh, you know, all of this programming stuff that we're throwing. Because like I said, we're told a lot of lies about Quiet in this game. And we're, we're, sh we're shown a lot of stuff that's very provocative about her. But if you don't understand all of the full context, you know, like I said about pause and stuff, you really won't have a clue why she's doing what she's doing or what her motivations are at all. Uh, and I think that's kind of dehumanizing and rude. So I want to talk about that for a little bit. <laughs> um, and I think that's possibly, you know, a lot of the reason why Kojima designed the character of Quiet in the way he did and chose a real human Stephanie Houston to model her off of explicitly and have even Houston be her voice and, like, sing songs as her and things. Like, it's, you know, he hasn't done that with, I don't, I don't recall if he's done that with any other character in Metal Gear before Houston explicitly like that. Like, the model is the, the face and the voice and everything is her, you know? Um... In a lot of ways, I think a lot of people's commentary on Quiet kind of edges on to like being rude to Stephanie Houston, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, there's there's a way to be critical of a character without being rude to the actor who played that character, y'all, you know. Um, and so I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna get on my freaking soapbox and and you know lecture a little bit about it just just cause. <laughs> um, let me see what else I got here going on. I think that's that's pretty much it. Uh, making sure I haven't skipped anything here for this whole lecture series. So yeah, that's it. Uh, hope you all have enjoyed the the first part of this lecture series. I'm gonna take a little bit of a break before I come back with the next few lectures that I do on just more general subjects in the Phantom Pain. And then after I'm done with that, uh, probably we'll do a similar style lecture series for another Metal Gear Solid game. I haven't decided yet which one I'm gonna do. I've kind of got it narrowed down to a couple of different choices, uh, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, there, you know, there might be new stuff with Konami. Might come out with a new uh, uh, a new announcement, you know, about Delta or something like that. And I might have to just change my plans or something. So we'll see. But uh, anyways, hope you all have enjoyed. That's the end of this lecture number twenty-three. Y'all have a good one. Peace.